Hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the nice words. So um, allow me to talk a little bit about hormones and the relationship to heart disease or cardiac health in men. And uh, I don't want to talk about testosterone and growth hormone used for um, reasons for age management or uh, body composition reasons. I want to focus on what we did scientifically in cardiology. I'm a cardiologist um, uh, where the use of hormones has, been, has gained a widespread attention initially more in women but now more recently in men too. So what is really known uh, on uh, uh, using growth hormone or and or testosterone in cardiac disease, and I would like to talk a little bit about that. So allow me first to um, mention a few facts or factoids on heart disease in general. As you know, uh, the, the two main conditions uh, which lead finally to death and to aging is congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease. And those two conditions remain the greatest threat to health among the aging population, and about aging I mean the baby boomer generation. Heart failure in particular, which uh, affects now more than 7 million people in the United States, becomes more and more common, uh, interestingly, especially among women at older ages, and in those uh, patients we often see heart failure with what we call preserved ejection fraction, so it's not that easily diagnosed. So if we look at the age distribution of, of cardiovascular disease in general, um, here for males and females, um, as you know, uh, cardiac disease has been uh, a disease of the older age. And if you look here at that uh, N. Haynes publications from a couple of years ago uh, from the American Heart Association, among uh, the ages above 75 years, uh, almost 80% of men and women suffer from some degree of cardiovascular disease. So we all will get it. There's no question oh, we might have it already. So, and it's even more important to think about prevention, but if we are at the stage where we have a cured already cardiovascular disease, of course we need to treat it adequately. Do you mind to click on that image, please? So this is an example of someone with heart disease or heart failure. This is an echocardiogram. This is a left ventricle, left atrium here is uh, the, the right ventricle. And you can see that the overall contractile pattern here is significantly reduced. The contractile force is reduced. If you would measure an ejection fraction, which give, gives us a means of contractility of the left ventricle, you would measure something less than 10% in this particular case. And you can imagine that that patient will have symptoms. So um, this is a majority of patients we are seeing is in a stage like that. And uh, we call this, of course, heart failure. We don't use the term congestive heart failure anymore because not everybody is congested, um, but heart failure in general. And heart failure, interestingly, is a multi-organ syndrome. Um, it starts, of course, with a weak heart, but it affects sooner or later every single organ system. And in treatment, and that's why I'm talking about this a little bit, we sometimes try to concentrate purely on left ventricular dysfunction rather than on the multi-organ symptom complex of heart failure. So besides the heart, the brain is affected. Of course, the kidneys are affected, adrenal glands, the vasculature, and the entire body, whether it's the arteries, the veins, the skeletal muscles, uh, the, the, the liver is congested. So all this leads to multi-organ disease and our treatment nowadays is mainly focused on the heart muscle rather than on, on a, a multi-organ complex disease. So just a few numbers I mentioned. Now we consider even then more than 7 million Americans are diagnosed already with chronic heart failure. There is approximately 500,000 new diagnosed cases every year in the United States and 250,000 people die every year because of heart failure. And interestingly, this is over three times the number of breast and prostate cancer deaths combined. We forget this if we treat a patient with heart failure, that the, the, the outlook, the outcome of heart failure is, is terrible. It's worse than most cancers. 
There's almost a million hospitalizations every year for heart failure in the United States, and it's the only entity in cardiovascular medicine with increasing incidence. And that's not the case for strokes, as you know, that's not the case for uh, heart attacks, that's not the case for acute coronary syndrome, but that's definitely the case for heart failure. And it's a very uh, expensive um, uh, condition with more than 37 billion dollars in expenditures every year, mainly caused by hospitalizations. So in heart failure, we, we often have an index event that might be a heart attack, that might be a virus infection leading to um, idiopathic non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, or might be anything which we not even know. And over time, there's compensatory mechanisms which oftentimes lead to a dilation of the left ventricle, and then from an asymptomatic so to a symptomatic state with reduction in ejection fraction. So the lower the ejection fraction, usually the, the worse the symptoms. And of interest, there's a downward spiral of the course with each cardiac decompensation, meaning often hospitalizations, even with adequate therapy, there might be some degree of recovery, but never back to the original status quo. So over time, this leads to a progressive worsening of cardiac function and subsequently to death. So um, why do we want to do more than the standard therapies, including, of course, hormone therapy? So we try to do something what we call the multidisciplinary management nowadays of heart failure treatment. Why, why do we do this? Because, as I mentioned, the prognosis is terrible in heart failure in general. The therapy is very expensive. The quality of life for heart failure patients is worse due to um, uh, a survey recently among COPD patients, psychiatry patients, chronic infections, HIV, heart failure, heart failure patients, in fact, have stated the, the worst quality of life because of the severity of symptoms and the major impact on their psychosocial environment. It leads to multi-organ involvement. It leads to recurrent hospital admissions and infects the entire social environment, including the caregivers and the family. So the, the, the usual therapy you all know about is using uh, drugs uh, such as beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, hydrolysin nitrates, diuretics, digoxins. If none of those work, or even if they work for a while, but if the condition gets worse, then the Ultima ratio is cardiac transplantation. We are now the largest transplant center in the world at Cedar sinai uh, We are doing more than 70 uh, per year. Most centers do less than 10, you know, probably that per year. And the survival is relatively good. The, the half-life is basically more than 10 years now. After 10 years, approximately 50% of patients are still alive. I usually ask the question, what is the oldest age you can transplant someone? There is no age limit anymore. We transplant patients in their mid-70s. But not everybody is a transplant candidate, of course, mainly because of comorbidities or age reasons often concomitant renal failure might be a problem. So um, we need more than just transplants, and there's only 2,200 done per year in the United States in general.